Hi, I'm Matthew Burrows. And I'm Senga Bosniak. The 10th of July marks three decades since the sinking of the Greenpeace protest ship, the Rainbow Warrior. It was a significant event in New Zealand's history and one which affected the lives of many. It was the first act of terrorism in New Zealand and it shocked the nation, but it also brought the country together. Our reporters have found that the event continues to impact on the lives of those involved and they've discovered how the story is being passed on to the next generation. But first, we catch up with the vessel itself. It's 30 years since it was laid to rest amid controversy in Northland. Here's Erin Speedy. Submerged in 1987, beneath the tranquil waters of the Kavali Islands off Matodi Bay lies the peaceful Rainbow Warrior. The actual morning of the burial of the sinking was very emotional for people. There was hundreds and hundreds of crafts, and I tell you, and some of these hard-nosed fishermen, even tears were running down their eyes, but she refused to sink. She refused, and it actually took nearly four and a half hours on a very clear morning off the Cavallis in 22 metres of water uh, that she finally said goodbye. And by the time I left there, small fish was on the, on, on the after deck of the, uh, of, of the warrior, and the Greenpeace flag was still flying in the current. A popular tourist destination, thousands of holidaymakers come in summer to take a break, go fishing and to see the Rainbow Warrior Memorial and dive the wreck. As the years go on, the wreck becomes more significant, uh, it's changing and it's amazing. I think that uh, there is some parallel between the principles of the warrior in regard to defending the environmental status of the South Pacific. Uh, it was an honourable thing to do, to give it the appropriate conclusion of its Life on the surface, it started it all over again. So it's become a, a real a garden of Eden, if you like, for the creatures under the sea they were vowing to protect while she was afloat. Although it was a controversial decision to submerge the wreck off Matodi Bay, the Rainbow Warrior has proved to be an integral part of their community. It gave uh, our people a spiritual connection, uh, not only to the efforts of the crew of the Rainbow Warrior and Greenpeace, but in fact to the waka itself, Te Waka Taua Anua Niwa. That is the Māori name for the Rainbow Warrior. Protecting our country's coastal waters is a key focus for Greenpeace New Zealand today. And one of the greatest threats is a possible oil, sp oil spill from deep sea oil rigs that are just 180 kilometres off our shores. With strong sea currents, a spill could devastate some of our most iconic beaches. Kendall Hutt has more. Murawai Beach is one of Auckland's most iconic surfing beaches, but it's also ground zero for a potential oil spill that could devastate the beach's precious ecosystem. Since 2010, Greenpeace New Zealand have been campaigning to stop such devastation, but a question still remains as to whether their efforts have made a difference. Oil companies leaving is the most obvious mark of success. Can we claim that as exclusively as a result of our campaigning? I don't think that would be uh, um, entirely accurate. Greenpeace New Zealand aren't the only ones campaigning to stop deep sea oil. The local community here in Mirawai are also passionate about standing up to the big guys, the oil industry. For the 1100 residents of Mirawai, there's no question that they would muck in to help clean up their beach. We'd be stopped working and be cleaning. I imagine we'd be you know, helping pick up the animals and scrape it off the beach and clean the rocks and do whatever we can to get the environment um, back in an acceptable state, which I mean obviously should be no oil. Oil spill modelling shows that in a worst case scenario, oil would reach Murawai shores in less than a week. Some say this could easily be avoided by a move to clean energy. A lot of opportunities have been missed in terms of the clean energy sector, which is booming globally and should be booming here in New Zealand, but we're currently missing the boat because National is so heavily focused on uh, fossil fuels. With deals still being done behind closed doors, Greenpeace and local communities will continue the fight for an oil-free future. And while New Zealand is renowned for taking a stand against nuclear testing, 30 years on, we find that international oil companies are putting the country's clean, clean green reputation to the test. We've seen how oil drilling can be a risky business, but could we benefit from the rewards? Jordan Bond finds out. On the eve of the 30th anniversary of the Rainbow Warrior bombing, 
there's another issue threatening to damage our waters. The government's opening up of more than 425,000 square kilometres of oil exploration areas means international petroleum companies are looking for their next big fortune in New Zealand's backyard. Greenpeace's Steve Abel says oil exploration not only endangers our waters but is a step in the wrong direction. Oil and gas and coal are a sunset industry. Why are we going down the old 19th century route? We should be going for what the future is, and the future is clean energy. Petroleum Body CEO Cameron Madgwick says the oil industry is heavily regulated. More than 40% of revenue goes straight to the government, and gaining drilling consent is a lengthy and robust process. It's not, it's not an activity that happens easily, drilling. It's something that we take time to make sure we... Um, progress in a safe way once we understand the environment we're going into. Supporters of the oil and gas industry in New Zealand recognise small risks do exist in deep sea drilling, but point to the economic value it has for the country. However, Mr Abel says if an oil spill did occur, the damage to the country's tourism and export sectors would far outweigh the revenue the government receives. In those industries, we would say, rely very much on us not having oil washing on our beaches, not having dozens of oil rigs dotted around our coastline. We want to be on the forefront of leading the world to a clean, green, sustainable future. With seven exploration areas now open for tender, the government is inviting bids from industry players, and successful permit applications will last for up to 15 years. And despite the best efforts of organisations like Greenpeace, it looks as if New Zealand will continue to be a treasure trove of black gold. The Rainbow Warrior brought about a whole industry of books and each takes a unique look at the first act of terrorism against us. The latest is a new edition of Eyes of Fire, written by AUT professor David Roby. And as Caitlin Morby discovered, it is photos that no one else has. It's photos like these of David's that have caused many books to be published about the Rainbow Warrior. Well, naturally, I was the only uh, author that um, wrote a book about um, the voyage, the last voyage of the Rainbow Warrior. That's, um, and so that was one of the features of that book when it was first published. There was a lot of photographs um, uh, that I took on the, the voyage. The bombing of the Rainbow Warrior is a well-known historical event in New Zealand. However, not many people are aware of the huge sacrifices crew members made on the Rainbow Warriors' last voyage. Tony Morrow of Little Island Publications aims to educate people of this through the publication of David Roby's fifth edition of Eyes of Fire. A lot of New Zealanders in particular have heard about the bombing of the Rainbow Warrior, but hardly anyone knows about Ronga Lap and, uh, and, and the great uh, deed that, that uh, Greenpeace did by going in that at, you know, at the request of the, the people of Rongelup to evacuate them, to move them. So hopefully some people will buy the book, but, but at the moment we're just very, we're just stoked that so many of, of the younger generation are interested in it. Organisations like Greenpeace survive on the strength of its numbers. But between the Xbox and social media, we wondered if younger people care about environmental causes. Natasha Free went searching and found a young woman who may have discovered the key to engaging the next generation. So how much do you care about the environment? Uh, maybe uh, 80%, I guess. Lots, lots. How do you um, care for it in the everyday kind of life? Um... Probably the easiest way would be uh, fire rubbish, put it in the bin. As environmental issues become harder to ignore, some question whether the youth of today care enough. Emma Wingrove is taking matters into her own hands, organising beach cleanups around the Auckland area. I was walking along Takapuna Beach at the beginning of last year, and pretty much every step I took, I was picking up rubbish. And I thought, as a member of the community and an environmental science student, I couldn't really identify that there was a problem, and then just walk away from it. So, do the youth of today really care? I don't think they do, really. I just don't think that they've got a big enough understanding of the big picture. They are completely disconnected from issues around the world. I think there has to be lots of opportunities created and events that students can relate to, that youth can relate to, um, things that are directed at their age group. The youth 
don't want to go and sit in some board meeting discussing some issue. We need to find ways that's going to interest them. For those wanting to make a change, Emma had some final words of advice. I'd say just do it. Find something that really speaks to you and just do it. Some good pointers there. As a team, this made us want to look at the way Greenpeace and the story of the Rainbow Warrior is portrayed in schools. Do schools still remember the bombing? Do they still teach it within the curriculum? Here's Gretchen Hatton. It seems schools out when it comes to basic knowledge about the Rainbow Warrior. I heard it was a ship that was bombed by French people, but that's really what I know about it. That it was a boat that got bombed. And to be honest, I don't know anything about that, but I kind of know a story or something about the bridge. It hasn't always been that way. It's living education, whereas what I've seen on, on the most of the government websites, the uh, even the National Museum and those, those sorts of websites, it's very static and very boring, to be perfectly honest. The week after the, the bombing of the warrior, I was teaching French at Selwyn College and that day I didn't teach French, I talked about what had happened and the journey of the warrior through the Pacific at that point. I do go back to being one of the ancient ones of the Greenpeace crews. I was literally there when the, before the warrior got his rainbow. St Dominic's students we spoke to would be more interested in learning about New Zealand history. I think so because in a way it's kind of similar to the Wahine disaster. I think they should. It sounds important. Better education provided will fill this gap. It's often the images of terrorism that have the strongest impact. Think of America's Twin Towers, for example. So it's ironic that one of our country's greatest photographers never intended her pictures to be used for anything other than educating her family. Therese Henkin reports. Gil Hanley was at home in her darkroom when she first heard about the explosion at Marsden Wharf where the Rainbow Warrior was anchored. Greenpeace contacted me and said, well, we've lost Fernando, can you take some photos for us? And I said, yeah. So I spent the next three months going down every day and taking a few shots of what they were doing in the reclamation and then raising it and taking it over to the dry dock. And then I had a pass to go into the dry dock, so I took all sorts of photos there. At the time, Gil didn't know that her pictures would be used in books and exhibitions throughout the world. She's now one of New Zealand's most significant social movement photographers. I think photographs um, basically tug at um, in people's conscience and uh, they immediately sort of um, bring them into, you know, responding to the situation that uh, the, the pictures are portraying. And, and certain photographs become iconic. It was sort of amazing, really, but the damage inside was appalling. Gill captured all this and she just really had this, you know, she really sort of summed up just how devastating that damage was from the two bombs. And it also brings home, I think, that uh, what a miracle it was that uh, uh, more people didn't die. Of course, all the other images that she took, she was probably the photographer who got the best images uh, of the damage. What I tell young people to do now, photograph what's around you, what you're involved with. Gil never expected her photos to be used for anything other than educating those close to her. But since then, they have become so much more important than that. Another acclaimed New Zealand photographer has demonstrated his passion for activism through his coverage of iconic protests. Our reporter George Freeman spoke to John Miller about the significant effect photography can have on activism. Photographer John Miller has been capturing pivotal events in New Zealand's history for over four decades, including the 1985 Rainbow Warrior bombing. It was a sort of a moment in time which is very significant, um, given how important it was, a sort of a, uh, incident of state terrorism. It was uh, really sort of horrifying for those of us who had been on board the ship 24 hours previously. This is a photograph of the photographer who got killed. Uh, and this photograph that was taken about 10 hours before the explosion. It was a huge shock. The photos John took of the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior have featured in numerous publications worldwide. Yeah, I think they had a great impact. And, you know, the, the, these images end up on, in books, on book covers and 
printed in various places. Journalist David Roby says John Miller's iconic photography has contributed greatly to activism. In my book Eyes of Fire, all the covers in the different editions have been you know, John's photos. So many of his pictures uh, have inspired people you know, that, um, and carried on his struggle. John says photography plays a fundamental role when it comes to activism. Subsequent to one taking these photos, how they derive a, a value with the passing of time. So, you know, I think there are some images that are very powerful and uh, it all adds to sort of keeping these events strong in people's memories. Storytelling plays a big role in any significant historical event. And for the first time, the bombing of the Rainbow Warrior has been reenacted on the stage. Hannah McLean reports. The story has been told many times before by history teachers, parents, or perhaps your elderly neighbour. But we've never heard it like this. For the first time, not only do we hear the story, but we can see and feel what it was like to be on the Rainbow Warrior almost 30 years ago. A play produced by two Auckland theatre groups, Fallout commemorates the tragedy that shook our nation. The story itself is an important part of New Zealand history and it's the right time to be remembering that story and to kind of bring it to life in a new way and there's never been a play produced about that before. It's no fairy tale but it is a story that needs to be told. Now that I know a lot about it it's a huge part of New Zealand history and I think it's something that New Zealand can be proud of. It should be told in lots of different ways not just in a theatre space. There are lots of other ways that we can tell the story and we should. Since the tragedy, a handful of documentaries have been made to tell the tale of the Rainbow Warrior. The idea of retelling the Rainbow Warrior story is it's an essential part of our, our New Zealand history. Documentaries for me are kind of a way of, of going back and seeing those people that were involved in that very specific event. You've got to remember things like that, whether it be a play, whether it be a documentary, whether it be a book. And though the curtains have fallen, the week of sold out shows has done its part to keep the Rainbow Warrior in the hearts of New Zealanders. In Auckland's Hauraki Gulf, the island of Waiheke remains a safe haven for many of the crew who were aboard the night of the disaster. Martini Goche was first mate on the Rainbow Warrior and lives on the island. So does Margaret Mills, who is the relief cook at the time. Yana O'Gorman looks at how they are still connected to each other and their local community. Martini Goche is a survivor of the Rainbow Warrior bombings by French intelligence 30 years ago. He now resides on the peaceful Waiheke Island and volunteers for Waiheke Radio after his daughter encouraged him to. Uh, we look for tracks to get a yenna, uh, for, to, for, to make a CD to play on a show. And uh, at one stage she asked me, hey, don't you want to do a show? And uh, I thought, yeah, maybe, yeah, not a bad idea. Margaret Mills, the relief cook on the Rainbow Warrior at the time of the bombing, also lives on the island. It changed my life in that I made a lot of new friends, a lot of friends that were younger than me and are, are, who are still my friends today. Unfortunately, one of those friends didn't make it. Fernando Pereira drowned after being trapped in his cabin. Fernando was there. I saw him in his, uh, in his uh, cabin door. He, he had his cameras, you know. He wanted to uh, take pictures. Obviously, he was a photographer on board. Uh. Martini and Margaret both continue to give back to the Waiheke community. Margaret wrote a poem in honour of Fernando. No matter he seeking death between the narrow walls of man-made faith, he gave his work and enjoyed the giving. He should be famed not for dying, but for living, for how he used his life and for caring. He did not give his life, they took it. He left a memory of life and laughter. I'm glad he liked the bread. The daughter of an original Rainbow Warrior crew member has taken on the legacy handed down from her mother. Brenna Gauthier says her mother's advocacy for Greenpeace has influenced her own personal journey. Amy Shaw has the story. Good afternoon, this is Greenpeace. You're speaking with Brenna. Brenna Gotchi has been working for Greenpeace for six years. She started off as a street campaigner and now works as a support relations manager in the Mount Eden office. Across the Hauraki Gulf, 
Original Rainbow Warrior crew member Susie Newborn lives on Waiheke Island. Susie is Brenna's mother, though despite her own well-known fervency for environmental issues, she plays down the influence she has had on her daughter. We never um, said to her, oh, you, you should go and work for Greenpeace. In fact, I probably said, you shouldn't go and work for Greenpeace. But um, yeah, so no, there's been no pushing, no influencing, nothing. Her decision to work for Greenpeace was entirely her own. The two live down the road from each other and have had a close-knit bond since Brenna was very young. But she insists her mother's reputation hasn't advanced her through the ranks at Greenpeace. I went there um, on my own bat. Um, I didn't say who my mum was or who my dad was. Um, that came a little bit later and I was like, oh yeah, my mum, yeah, she named the Rainbow Warrior. But I'm here because I believe in what we're doing. And Brenna wants to fuel the same passion into her own children. I'm really excited um, and I love being part of um, the organisation and being part of that change. And I look forward to having children so where I can show them my parents and, uh, and what they did. <laughs> Still on Waiheke, what Amy didn't mention is that Susie Newborn has a few projects of her own. I discovered some precious pieces of memorabilia retrieved from the hull of the Rainbow Warrior 30 years ago. Susie Newborn is one of the original crew members who founded the Rainbow Warrior. She has been with the Greenpeace ship since day one when it was bought and named. She wasn't on board the vessel at the time of the bombing, but her heart still sank with it. I just remember being absolutely devastated. Not in a month of Sundays would I have ever expected a major European country to come in and blow up a peace boat. We must have been doing something right to have, to have upset them that much. Now, 30 years on, Susie's still an activist as well as a filmmaker and writer living on Waiheke Island, and the Rainbow Warrior continues to be a large part of her life. I don't think I've ever actually left the Rainbow Warrior. Mm. The Rainbow Warrior has been part of my life ever since. Um, you know, I've got Rainbow Warrior rust in a ring here. I've got copper from some part of the Warrior on my wrist. Susie has an amazing collection of memorabilia, which is being put to use by Maori jeweller Timmy Smith for the 30th anniversary. She's using parts of the ship to create a special jewellery range. I don't want to give it away, it's all secret at the moment, but I know that she's come round and we've looked at all different pieces and I've given her lots of rust and, and she's gone away to her studio. So I'm really looking forward to seeing, the, seeing what she comes up with. And to add to that memorabilia, here's something you'll find interesting. This tale comes from David Roby, who had been on board the Rainbow Warrior for 10 weeks as an independent journalist. He left the ship after she arrived in Auckland three days before the bombing. He grabbed his bag, his cameras and his typewriter and he stepped ashore. But he forgot one important item, his passport. He'd left it locked in the captain's safe on the bridge, only for, the st only for it to sink along with the bombed ship. But a few weeks later he managed to get it back, a little water damaged, from the Devonport Naval Base. The salvage team had treated the passport with chemicals, but you can still clearly see his arrival date, the 7th of July 1985. It's no wonder it's now a prize memento. 30 years has passed, it's clear the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior continues to be significant to many. May it be a story that is always remembered by New Zealanders. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.